that aside, let me introduce my guest tonight. He, um, I've worked on the Borough Library Commission for a number of years, and through that I've grown to appreciate the importance of libraries, public libraries, but all libraries, not only for communities, but for an open society in general. So I was especially delighted when I learned Paul would be our guest tonight. Uh, many of you know, and I can see some shutter bugs in the audience, know his wonderful work in photography, capturing the dynamic moments in many Nanook and other sporting events. And I hope we get some time to talk about his photography tonight. But the university community knows him as a talented administrator and dedicated professional. I have lost count of the number of times UAF has turned to him to ask him to helm the libraries or a section of the university administration when they're looking for somebody more permanent. This is after he retired. And so I wouldn't be surprised tonight when I get done to find out they've asked him to join them again for something. So I'm not taking bets on that. He received his Bachelor of Science degree um, in history in 1962 from St. John Fisher and his master's in library science from Syracuse University in 1964. That year he joined the staff at UAF's Rasmussen Library and the next year became the archivist. He was appointed head of the Alaska Polar Regions Department in 1981, a role he served on until he became the director of libraries in 1987. In 1994, he became Director of Libraries Emeritus and entered the private sector, where he served as President and Chief Financial Officer of WLN, a bibliographic utility. And we'll find out what that is. Um, in 2000, the university asked him to come back and helm the UAF Libraries and Information Technology. In 2006, he served as Interim Vice Provost of Research until he retired again. <laughs> he was a consultant to the School on Economic Development until 2010, and then was again asked to come back as interim dean of libraries for more than a year. So please welcome Paul McCarthy. <laughs> I, I'm more of the bad penny. You know, the <laughs> bad penny comes back again and again. You know, on what do you know, he always said, let, sit on your hand and let somebody else answer, you know, and it's <laughs> like, but um, uh, we have microphones for the auditorium if you have trouble hearing. So just speak up if you have trouble hearing Paul or myself, and then we can use these handheld units. We're also taping this, and so if you have friends or relatives who might want to watch, it'll be on the UAF Summer Sessions website. Uh -huh. In, in a couple of weeks. So, Paul, let's start with family. I always like to find out a, peop, a person's background. Um, Where did you grow up, and was education always in the cards for you, higher education? Well, I grew up in, I was born in Rochester and, and grew up there until I left for graduate school. Uh, I was the oldest of three boys. Uh, we had a lot of family in that area. My, my mother had six sisters and a brother, uh, and my father had five brothers. Mm. And uh, I have uh, 23 cousins, you know, it was, uh, and that was a couple didn't marry, you know, so the odds were, you know, the base unit was two and up to five <laughs> or six, so lots of cousins around there. And it was a Catholic, you know, family community and uh, went to grammar school and high school. And I'll tell you a joke about that later. Uh, why high school didn't prepare me for my initial choice. <laughs> uh, and then I, uh, well, that's the base part. What, do you want more on that or? No, that's great. Because what I want to ask about is um, at, Say John Fisher, you uh, majored and graduated in history, but then when you went for your graduate degree, you went to library science. So why did you switch from history to library science? Well, there are a couple couple reasons, uh, and and 
education was really important to our family. But I and my cousin were the first of the folks in Rochester to, to go to a university. Uh, my, my dad had to leave, I don't even know if he got to high school, wow. to work. And my mom uh, went to a, a two-year uh, vocational school. So, but in the Irish tradition, education was really important mm -hmm. and, and learning was really important. So I, I initially started off as a chemistry physics major. No kidding. Right. And uh, I, I don't know if I crashed and burned, but I <laughs> certainly uh, was ill-prepared to do that in college because I had gone to the seminary when I was in high school. So there, there was a rigorous curriculum in the seminary, but it in no way prepared you for science and technology. <laughs> so it was a good background, great education. So I did turn to something I really enjoyed, history, mm -hmm. and with a minor, or another major in English and a minor in philosophy. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but library science, Okay, uh, the only library science on a baccalaureate level was really school librarianship. Mm. Uh, the li librarianship was viewed as a graduate program once you had a, a technical or an expertise in a particular subject area or a broader subject area. So uh, that's why, well, it's a funny story. I'm, I'm finishing my, nearing my degree finish and and thought, what am I going to do? You know, I, I'm not sure I want to teach. And uh, so I went to Rochester Institute of Technology that had kind of vocational testing in that and uh, did all of that. And then they came back and then in the interview said, they, well, I matched up with two groups, priests and ministers or librarians. And I thought, well, I already tried the first, so I'm not going to do that, right? So I tried for the second, and it's a, it was a, a great choice. It was really fun. And I went to Syracuse, and there's lots of stories about that. There's really well in the Middle Ages, monasteries were where the cache of books and information right was stored. Right. right. So, give me a picture about in the early '60s what library science was like, because of course, from that period in my recollection, you had these endless rows of of uh, card, uh, you know, catalog thing, and then the stacks were sometimes barred to you, but then there you had stacks. So that was library science to me, finding <laughs> the book in the card catalog <laughs> and then asking or going for it. Well, it, you know, it, it was an effective system at the time, uh, ponderous. Uh, what you would do tech, in, technolo in technical services that uh, you would get the book and there were a whole bunch, there were books and books of subject headings. And so you would look through the book and articulate and figure out what subject headings were appropriate for this book. And sometimes if you were fortunate, uh, you'd have clerks that go through these books from the Library of Congress that had all the data from all the books that they published. But you didn't copy it out. We, they developed special Polaroid cameras so the clerks would go they would take pictures of the entries in the books, and then you'd put them on a copy machine and you'd copy however many cards you wanted. So, uh, I mean, it was, you'd, you'd have a title card, an author card, sometimes a corporate author, about three subject headings, unless it was a rare book or something else. And the challenge was then you had to file these, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so, People, we'd have somebody file each of them. Mm. Not, the professionals didn't necessarily do that. And then, but they wouldn't put them in all the way because they wanted somebody else to check them because if you misfiled, they were as good as lost. Lost. I mean, you could maybe go a few cards off, but it's, uh, you know, it's a static system. So it was pretty intense. And a lot of the greater research libraries have closed stacks for at least a portion of it, but they usually have departmental collections which are open. Like in, in Syracuse, they had a multi-level, uh, huge stack, but if they had let all the undergraduates into that, people would be running up and down stairs all the time and 
it would be uh, a chaotic situation. And, you know, people tried to become experts in different subject areas, either to select books. There weren't a lot of selecting tools. Those came a little bit later, and uh, people would uh, be discipline-oriented so that you could specialize in science or bioscience and physics and music, so that you brought somebody who might have a dual master's into those particular areas. Wow, so quite complex. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of structure going on there that probably the general uh, patron wouldn't know or appreciate. You know, you don't think about how you how you get the book from the carton through the press into the stacks, and it's pretty intense and and uh, complex. So you graduate um, from Library Sciences. How did you get from the East Coast to Fairbanks? Well, I have to back up just a little bit. I worked full time when I was going to graduate school, you know, and I worked full part time when I was an undergraduate. Did not come from a wealthy family or an upper class family. Great family, but uh, we had to work to get through, you know. We didn't have a great debt. We have, I think my student debt was like three or four hundred dollars, you know. I mean, it was a lot more at that time than it sounds now, but it's not nearly like 10000 or $30,000. So uh, the first time I was a stack supervisor for a stack area, a city that encompassed a whole city block, an industrial uh, stack that nobody visited. We only stored books there, and we stored them by height so you could get more books in. So at least the stored ones. I mean, that's a tech, common technique in libraries, if you're, really? if you're storing books, yeah. not if they're used by the general public. The second year, I applied for a position in the university archives, which was the best decision I ever made. It was, uh, got me into the Syracuse University Archives. It was a really great place to learn, and I, uh, I uh, got a chance to not only understand how to process collections, but I got a chance to go out and, and be excited about getting a piece of history or a, a, a part of a collection of records or a collection of records that would document something that got pretty exciting when you get into it. And I had a chance to talk with Lowell Thomas Oh, really? Yeah. We, it was an aggressive program, probably more aggressive than it should have been. Uh, they would send out 50 or 75 letters a, a week, and they were researched, and they would look at people, check them out, da da da, da and they would essentially solic solicit collections from them. So it was a, it was a double-barreled shotgun approach. You know? Now, when you say aggressive, you're not threatening to break the patron's no, no, knees no. if they don't yeah. hand over the... No, 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 okay. no but it's... Uh, you know, in other people, it's a more gentlemanly or lady courting type yeah. thing, you know. Okay. And uh, so, uh, and I, when I met Lowell Thomas, I had been really intrigued by him because when I was much younger, I'd listened to his weekly program, and one of the programs was broadcast from Tibet and Lhasa, and he called it being on the top of the world. And it was a closed country for many years until the threat of the Chinese invasion and the Dalai Lama wanted to invite in people that would be able to see and enjoy and understand the country in the hopes that that would prevent the Chinese from coming in. So mm. I always had uh, this in my mind that I wanted to go to Tibet and I, I did like 50 years later, <laughs> 40 years later. <laughs> Just a little detour. <laughs> right, right. So, but the associate director at Syracuse who had hired me in the first place took the position as director of libraries here when they wanted to revamp how they did libraries and what they did in a new approach and a more assertive or aggressive approach to libraries. And he asked me kind of flippantly if I'd ever consider coming to Alaska. And I said, sure, sure, anything for a few years. And so the next year he offered me a position in the reader services area because he had a vacancy, but he said he wanted to start the archives in 65, and so he was able to secure the money, and we started. 
Well, that let's go then to archives um, because I just have a picture that last scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark, <laughs> where a crated, you know, ark is filed somewhere in a huge warehouse <laughs> yeah. and nobody will find it again, <laughs> just like those miscued cards. Uh, what do we mean by archives, and what are the challenges of bringing in material, correctly documenting it, and then preserving it? Well, to, to get back just a little bit, the term, official term for archives is usually corporate or some legal entity. They're mm -hmm. records. And so we called it archives versus manuscript collections. So a manuscript collection would be your personal papers or something else less than an official archive for a university. Because in that sense, uh, provenance is really important to prove that you've had custody of those records, that they are, that they document what you say they document and, mm -hmm. and represent your operations. So there was both of those that we started. And uh, huh. with the manuscript collection, it was, uh, we started contacting like pioneers and some other people. And you know, as you go along, the tree gets larger because people understand what you're doing and you get contacts and that. But before or at the simul simultaneously, uh, you mentioned this earlier, uh, we had to go through the collection that Otto Geist got together. Well, his collection was a warehouse probably 20 to 25 feet wide. Wow about 20 to 30 feet long, and it was on the hillside. And some of you are old enough to remember that we used to have three or four sheds going down the hill on the left-hand side across from forestry. And so initially we opened the doors and it was like eight feet high. It was eight feet high, you know? So, you know, you start going through it and it sometimes you just, got up on top and you crawled <laughs> through and you kind of dipped down and got stuff. But it, it was, uh, there was some fantastic stuff there. You know, I think uh, the, Ameri uh, the Alaska Commercial Company records were there that had been transferred to the university, some early records. Wow. And he saved everything, everything. You know, he got a solicitation from Time, he saved it. He had his appendix taken out, he saved that. And Save the appendix? Right. He scared the hell out of one of our assistants. She opens this thing and she finds this specimen there. And she <laughs> tried to figure out what it was all about, you know? Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, and we, when we started the archives, we went through some of the utilidors. People now at the university don't realize that these Utilities were used for student traffic and storage and stuff like that. And uh, occasionally students still try to get through them, but I think they've barred off most of them. But they used to be, you could go from Bunnell Building to any building on lower campus. Is there a chance we'll, if we did those go those quarters, we'd find Geist's uh, <laughs> appendix somewhere <laughs> in you, the... We try to clean all those out, you know. <laughs> Because there were, there were records there. I mean, it was a place, a warm place to store records. And if you're short of space, you utilize utilities. Well, okay, now that raises a really interesting point because I know some of this material that you must acquire in for the archives are fragile or can be damaged if the air is too humid or too mm -hmm. dry or there's too much heat or whatever. So how, how do you determine I guess, how do you coordinate which items need to be treated delicately and which could be more robust and go into those utilidors? <laughs> well, that was a <laughs> that was a, that wasn't a preservation choice oh, at all. Okay, was, I see. No, no, it wasn't. Uh, they were just storing it. It wasn't preserving it. So we found those and then we uh, brought them back. We had a small classroom in. Uh, the Benel building downstairs. It was, you know, probably, oh, this, that wasn't even this square, maybe from there to there square. 
Mm. And so we, we had it crammed full in the first two years or something like that, because we got the papers of Ralph Rivers, who had been in Congress for sure. a couple of turns. And we've gotten other things, or lots of commercial company records and things like that. So we, uh, we were bulging at the seams, and so was the library. We, the library was, at that point, it was in the Bennell Building, the w east, the west side of the Bennell Building on three floors. So you'd come in on the main floor and there would be books and upstairs was the government documents and periodicals I believe were downstairs mm. and some current materials were there and the famous lady named Lou was the, the painting that was visited often by tourists yeah. in the building. That's great. Well, when, you, when was the addition to the library put on, and when was the, the library's current home really finalized? Were you part of that? Uh, yes. Uh, there was a big bond drive in uh, a bond vote in 1966, I think it was. It would be 66, to essentially bond for the library, the fine arts center, and the theaters. So the, that successfully passed. So they began building the library and shortly after, I think in June of that year, or mm. June of 19, 1967, and it took about two years. And uh, Well, that raises a question, and I hope you talk just a little bit. I know you've been um, influential on many, helping with the design and, and considerations of several buildings. But when you go to construct a library, obviously books are heavy, there must be special designs you oh, yeah. want built in. Yeah. And this was in the early 80s, wasn't it, when some of that construction, late 70s, early Well, 80s. The, the, the major part of the library, the part that you come into initially, was built in 1966-68. In 1982-84, approximately, we built the addition, which That's is below grade, or below grade on the front end, Okay. And, and rehab some of it. So when you design a library, what are some key elements you hope are built in? Does, do librarians have a say in how it's designed? or? Well, there's architectural standards. Uh, because floor load is a really, really critical area for uh, shelving. I think it's like 175 pounds per square foot. Uh, and you, and you want to build that into the building as much as possible to give you the flexibility that you can move materials around. So that would be part of it. Ventilation is certainly another part, but that's more standard. But there are certain, there's in fact a whole book on standards for building libraries. Mm. Well, we'll maybe get back to buildings, but you know, uh, when you were tapped to be the head of Polar, the Polar Collection, that, I'm guessing, is a period of time when what you managed, or the, the library managed to amass, really became, there was greater awareness to this collection and it was more integrated across the circumpolar. Would that be right? How did the, the it was beginning to be right? Yeah. Uh, Talk about that growth. Uh, we started the archives, and we had a rare book uh, curator, and we started a service in indexing every current periodical for Alaska articles, the Alaska bibliography. Uh, we started oral history a little bit later because Bill had. Uh, started it separate as a sp special part. It's Bill and Schneider. Bill Schneider, right. And uh, I'm trying to think of other elements. And then we added a audio visual. Dirk Tordoff did film archives. Mm -hmm. So that all started coming together. And I think a lot of skilled professionals who were really good in their field, Marvin, Bill, others, uh, gave the department brought to the department an expertise. And I think going back to the, first, the director of libraries, Ted Ryberg, he instilled in me a real commitment to have a professional role, a role in the professional community. And so I've encouraged that, and, and they have done that. And, and that kind of spreads 
the, uh, the name of the university, of the Rasmussen Library, of the kinds of holdings you have, and that kind of thing. And, and uh, the grant writing, I think Marvin and I and Bill and several people have written grants to uh, produce uh, either finding aids or uh, share collections uh, outside of the university so that your reputation grows that way. And Ted Ryberg was one of the initial founders of the uh, Polar Libraries colloquy. Uh, and that gathered together people from both that studied the Antarctic and the Arctic in terms of a community. And so I think the reputation of the Rasmussen Library spread. And I think uh, Dr. Wood uh, humorously said, well, when he went to Europe, he would talk about the University of Alaska. And people didn't know very much about the University of Alaska. And then he would mention the Rasmussen Library. And this, oh, we know where that is. <laughs> you know, so the library had, I mean, people were really active, and there were lots of communications and sharing of material and uh, that kind of thing, so. Well, and being part of a research university and um, the, the growing importance of the polar regions, especially during the Cold War when, when it was a, an important strategic location, um, must have helped. But I have two questions coming out of that. And the first one, you mentioned this. So let me ask you, you've risen uh, you know, quite dramatically through the ranks of the university and leadership is an important skill. Was there a model you had of how to be a good administrator, how to be um, you know, uh, effective in that role? I think, uh, I think several things that I had done, many things that I had done earlier contributed to that. Uh, I had become very active in the Society of American Archivists, both on their council and treasurer, and had to explain things to other people, and particularly as a treasurer that they did not want to hear. <laughs> you know, like, we have to raise the dues. You know, we haven't raised the dues in a while, and this is why. And, and trying to communicate honestly, I think uh, integrity is a critical part of management. If you don't have integrity, you've got nothing. I think uh, respect, and I always believe, and we did this a lot, we did a lot of work with married couples of everybody has untapped talents. They're, they have lots of professional expertise or are more limited, but they have a lot of talent. So I think part of, I think my, my challenge as a manager or a leader is to provide an environment where people can really excel and, and support them with the logistics and the, the moral support, travel, whatever they need for, for, to develop a program. If it's important to them and it's important to us, we can really encourage that. And I think dealing with junior faculty, that's what you have to do, is you want to say, gee, you have a chance to really sparkle here at the university. In fact, that's the one of the major things I have really valued about this experience is that nobody in Alaska, at least when I have been active, would say, oh, we don't do it that way here. Yeah. Or, no, you can't do that. Or, why would you, you, you shouldn't, you know, just, just do this, you know? So we had a chance to, to initiate a lot of program, you know, if you get, get this financial support and justify it and go for it, you know, if it has some real contribution to the university's mission. So it's, uh, and I think it's a, uh, you gotta like people. You gotta like, I mean, it seems really strange, but a lot of people don't like, like people. And really to, uh, to respect them, to recognize that, you know, you're there to help them. You're not, you're not there as some autocratic boss. Mm -hmm. Well, the other question that came to mind as you were describing the growth of the polar um, archives, polar regions archives, is um, when you're collaborating with international agencies, is there a standardized sort of system that you cross-reference material from one country to another? Is there much of that? Or what, 
Because once your, your uh, status is elevated, you'll have people from other countries wanting to access your material. Well, they, uh, you know, each country, well, I think the U.S. was a leader in, in really uh, transforming libraries in terms of, of uh, using computing technology to make materials, to locate them, and to make them accessible, and to get them from one place to the other quickly. And uh, there's, there were two, util two or three bibliographic utilities that provided support for libraries' effort. One was OCLC and one was WLM, where I had worked in the, in, in the 90s. And they would provide this networked information. So there were standards established by the Library of Congress in conjunction with, you know, reputable, outstanding other non-governmental librarians. So yes, there's a standard, and it, it's really important that there was a standard because then you can adapt that to the computer age pretty easily rather than having to develop standards and then go. So they, libraries were using computers in, I think, mid to late 70s. We had uh, terminals in in the library by 76 or 77 with the Western Library Network. Well, let's go to that because during your term as head of libraries, the computer age is coming on. Uh, I'm guessing card files are out <laughs> and terminals are in. Um, talk about that transition a little bit and how easy is it to find software that's both user-friendly for the patron and, and the researcher and user-friendly for the librarian or administrator? Well, it's, sometimes they're not the same software. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sometimes they are. Uh, you know, the library as an industry is huge. I mean, you've got university libraries, you've got public libraries, you've got special libraries, you've got community libraries. So it's a big market for companies. So there were probably eight to 12 companies that were providing software choices for these. And, and it would be a gruesome and tough contract, protracted contract negotiation and, and identification of your requirements to, to get into any one of these systems. We picked one from uh, West, West Virginia. Uh, it was, oh, Marva, maybe you can help me with the name. They call, we called it Gnosis, but it was uh, Virginia Tech. And they were, they were, you know, it was a good system for when we adopted it. It didn't have stuff for special collections necessarily. Okay. So, but it did have for the libraries. But this was not an instant switchover. Uh, the university tried that once in financial systems in 77. We had five presidents that were, were touched by that crisis. I mean, it was like a disaster. So we ran essentially parallel systems. You still had the card catalog, but you terminated the card catalog at a certain date. And then you started the computer catalog. But we ran the computer catalog for a couple of years before we unveiled it to the public, both to test it and to get some basic uh, community you know, body of information in there. So we would run that and uh, there would be times when it would act strangely. And uh, we had to, one of our problems with the vendor was the contractors written in such a way that uh, it made expanding it really expensive. Mm -hmm. And so we had to redo the contract because I think our the previous people who had nego negotiated it and implemented it from outside the library had not followed the letter of the contract and had expanded it. So we had to explain to the company why we should not pay for Kotzebue and Gnome and the others the same fee that they would charge Syracuse University for the music library. I mean, they're like, okay, there's yeah. three people out there, very small collection. What they're doing is accessing our collection. So 
That's one of the challenges. Yeah, I'm sure. It must be negotiating it. And then you have to be quite nimble and adopt and adapt to this new software quite, I mean, you say over a period of years. But not everybody, I'm sure, even a librarian who's, you know, trained in, in information retrieval and, and whatnot, maybe can make that transition. Was it difficult for you and your colleagues as the computers came on? Or was it really a boon and, and it opened up new opportunities to, to catalog? And, and it was exciting enough that there was a lot of encouragement to do it. I mean, it really, it, it really transformed libraries incredibly because we could now, like I was talking about how you catalog and all these cards and keeping the cards up to, you know, I mean, you'd file hundreds or thousands of cards a week and you were buying these expensive units. I mean, those things were like six or $800 a piece. Wow. So, you know, when we sold them off, there was a real bargain if you had a use for <laughs> card catalog at home. <laughs> Not a big draw for <laughs> right. that, I'm guessing. The oak was worth more than the, <laughs> anything else. So, uh, so, I think the, like, we were the first department in the library to bring computers in. We brought them in in, I think, 1981 or something like that. And it was, uh, we had a grant from the state library, or no, the state uh, legislature to uh, arrange and describe Mike Gravel's papers. And we made the commitment to do this. In fact, we had been in a national uh, trial when they were, we were using punch cards in the late 60s. We had participated with the Library of Congress and National Archives and one or two other in national institutions. And I thought that was a great thing for us to do. I mean, it was, it put our name on the map at least, you know, I mean. So we realized what the incentive could be, what the promise could be, and, and it's just amazing. I mean, you, you realize now that you can access stuff from almost all over the world, mm. certainly all over the United States and Canada. Uh, you can get information and, and you know, it's only a revolution that continued. Like in the 90s, there was another financial crisis. And uh, so we made the, after really, really considering, we made the, I think this is pivotal, we made the decision really to start going completely uh, computer access to periodicals. We were carrying, I think, three or four thousand periodicals at the time at a massive cost of money. And they were inflating about 12% a year, way out of sync with everything right. else. The rate of inflation. The rate of, rate of, yeah. And so we had the opportunity to start to buy individual titles and collections. And that has evolved so that now libraries con con uh, connect in buy baskets of periodicals together. It's a, it's a funny way. Publishers are interested in selling as many copies of as many publications as they handle, right? Sure. Well, some of them are of uh, niche interest. But, you know, they figure out that they can sell you this entire basket at a substantial discount and throw in all these other titles. And so it's really an attractive purchase for you. And if you do it in a combine of libraries, you get a, a much better price. And so we thought we could offer uh, 100,000 subscriptions for less than it was costing us for 4,000. Wow. Yeah. That's quite a, a, a jump. Well, what you say triggers a couple of questions in my mind. You were a uh, director, of course, during the economic downturn in the late 80s. Uh, a when, scary, scary time. Scary time. Yeah. Well, today isn't so right, right. Yeah, great either. But let's talk about, as a leader, as, a, as an administrator, how do libraries weather those times when dollars dry up, you can't keep up collections the way you might want to? What are some of the strategies you and your colleagues 
come up with, just as you were explaining. But I'm, I'm sure that there are great challenges that come when you don't have the funding that is required. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a really difficult. In the mid-80s, it was uh, sudden, and the reductions were implemented very quickly. Um, many of the units, including the library, had no control over what was reduced. And uh, we had found that, well, the library had just staffed up like the year before. Mm. We brought in people specializing in uh, a collection, in a, a instructional development. People who could sit down with instructors and help them get into the computer age, get into the audiovisual age, and make, a, make their collections more multimedia. Mm. That was all gone within a year. I mean, we hardly got the people up here yeah. when this ha happened. And uh, we lost some other things. We had just finished the building. We had a brand new, not state of the art, but a really good uh, uh, studio uh, that went empty. I mean, we could hardly equip it. Uh, in fact, there were two studios like that. So. Uh, you know, we we trim, we didn't trim. We and and part of that reduction was the scary part was that we only had like an hour or so to notify staff that their names yeah. were on the list because it was going to be. I'm, I'm. This is not quite. I don't have the exact timeline, but they were going to release a report, and I, I believe we got the report like an hour or two oh, no. ahead, really? ahead of time. And we had to, some people were traveling. And you had to say, hey, Hank, uh, I have some bad news. You know, you're on the list. It doesn't mean you're going to be terminated, but you're on the list. I think terribly, terribly destructive. Yeah. So, I mean, I think you have to look at primary missions. You have to think creatively. Uh, one thing that we did in the 90s when we were everybody was supposed to say how they would reduce 5, 10, 15, and 20 percent. And rather than fighting it, the staff members who might be really affected by it, more, more likely to be affected by it, jumped in and really helped. And what we did is we did a diagram of the building, a side section of it, and we'd say, okay, 5% we strike out this and this. 15% you or 10% you strike this out. And 15% you eliminate this floor. And at 20% you get a new director because you don't need somebody who can, who can direct a bigger program anymore. You get, so we did the best presentation. Well, I'll bet you did. <laughs> and it was staff and I, you know, the most important employment Decision is who you hire. Mm -hmm. We had we've had great people in APR. We've had. Well, I've talked to several people who've been on committees with you, and they all just praise your abilities to work in a team and contribute. And when you moved up the ladder again and became um, uh, director of information technology, or when you were a provost. Talk about integrating the library in the wider university community. And then you've mentioned this before. You have to be part of consortiums. When you buy these, let's say, magazine subscriptions, you have to be part of a larger team in that regard, in that community as well. So to reflect a little bit about the library's place in the academy more broadly and, and how you worked in that environment. and then. I'm going to ultimately ask you, when you went into the private sector, what's the private sector look like for a librarian? Sure. So, but first, uh, let's talk about the university. Okay. Uh, let me think about that for a second. Uh, I always thought that library faculty should participate in the university and university committees and. I cut my teeth on faculty council and several others, and I worked on 
Tenure and Promotion Committee, and I chaired the Tenure and Promotion Committee. I, I felt that we had to do that because we wanted to make sure that people realized that we were a legitimate part of the academy, and we, we had a contrib contribution to make. And I think you, you talk about the value of the library, how it's doing, what, it, what it's able to provide, and you're being really aggressive on providing services. And that, you know, that's why we could provide services to faculty without ever coming to the library, which is a real plus, but the minus is then you don't want them to be, to be disconnected from where the stuff comes. Mm -hmm. A lot of people talk about, it's, oh, it's all free on the internet. Well, it's not all free on the internet. And uh, the really good stuff that takes money to produce unless it's National Geographic, is not free on the internet, you know. <laughs> so we, I think explaining what it is, participating, uh, and with the, uh, with the or organizations, that's usually a function of the acquisitions person, and they put a lot of time into uh, working with other organizations. And it could be like the Pacific Northwest, it could be Mountain States, it could be bio, uh, logical libraries, so it cuts geographically and subject-wise, so library might have been a member of four, five, eight, ten consortia. Mm. So let's turn in the 90s, you explored the private sector and became a CEO, and uh, ex you've mentioned it's, it's a huge industry, and w what does library science look like in the private sector? Well, it was, uh, WLN had been, as well as OCL, had been a pioneer in uh, developing bibliographic utilities, essentially a database of all of these citations and titles and s stuff like that, it, and less of the text, but that com had come late, was coming later. And uh, the model WLN used was library by library. Mm -hmm. The model at OCLC was state by state. So they were a little bit of, to a great deal ahead of OCLC. But in WLN, what they did was really go to the library and, and work with the library to get dedicated lines. This was early in the 70s. So there weren't really big computer centers. There was nobody else really that much interested in the internet. So libraries were kind of going it alone. So WLN, uh, the, all of the Pacific Northwest libraries were tied to WLN because of the dedicated cables. So that would be, you know, a way of doing it. In the 90s, that started changing because uh, you can, you know, it's like right now, if you want to buy some product, and you can buy it downtown, but you can't get it till next week when you go downtown, and you can get it day after tomorrow if you order it through Amazon. They started shopping around, uh, and it was the first, the, the utilities so changed the industry initially that all of the people that founded those utilities, including there's a research libraries uh, group too, were so profoundly committed and so existentially rewarded that they became almost religious <laughs> adherence. I mean, it was, it was like So a, that seminary training came <laughs> in handy, didn't it, there? I mean, it was, it is, it was, for the older people, it had made such a dramatic change all to the good that, that they, they were absolutely committed to it. Hmm. Younger people coming up and with some of the financial pressures didn't have that same emotional connection. So they started looking around and, and some tried to do it on the cheap by essentially borrowing data from other sites by, you know, doing uh, screen captures or stuff like that. So yeah. uh, we had to change. And uh, so uh, the bibliographic utilities have then also provided access to these baskets of 
periodicals too. So they're trying to broaden theirs. And when I was uh, there, I realized that at one point that we were really too small for the internet economy as it was evolving. So we had to either bulk up or sell. Hmm. And so we tried, you know, and I had never done negotiating for mergers and that, but it was a, it's a steep but quick learning curve. <laughs> learning curve. So we tried to buy a, a couple of companies and, and they didn't, they tried to buy us and that didn't work. And then we went to Canada and we we're gonna buy a Canadian company and we made an offer. We really did a careful cost analysis of what we thought it was worth to us. And we made what we thought is a reasonable offer. The company that we we're going to buy that didn't work out, they made this outrageous offer. And we said, how can they do that? How can they do that? Well, in the due diligence process, they gradually lowered, 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 lowered their bid till they were like $25,000 above ours. And this is like hundreds of thousands that they came down. So we didn't realize that part of it is, I don't want to say bluff and whatever it is. Right. Yeah. So uh, at some point we realized that we really needed to negotiate with our arch competitor. And so they had, they, their board was doing a total review of what they were supposed to be Mission, their mission, and they wanted new blood from outside of the thing. So I called, once he was appointed, but before he went, I called him up and just left the message that we're your competitor, but we could be a, you know, a, a ally and love to talk to him when he would get to OCLC. Well, he uh, called me up, he left, he, I went to lunch and he already had called me, and so we talked for about two hours and then we met uh, made an appointment to meet secretly in St. Louis, way away from our home and their home. Did you have to wear a disguise? <laughs> <or> <laughs> no, we, but we, you know, we, uh, it was really funny. Uh, and we could not talk about it. You could not share it with anybody because it would damage us and it would damage them. Mm. And if it damaged us, we would, and we thought that they did it maliciously, we could, we could sue them. Mm. And they knew that. So, uh, then we made a, uh, had another meeting in August, and then we went through due diligence on the weekend in October, and then announced it in a meeting uh, within the week. Wow. It was an incredible surprise to everybody, yeah. even some of our own company. <laughs> well, obviously a success. How did that, when you returned to the university, inform your work then moving forward because at that point you're overseeing not only libraries but technology and whatnot. How did that change things for you, Paul? And how do you position the school for the future? Maybe that's the question. Yeah, I think uh, one of the shocks to me was uh, I went to, I was on the board at WLN and I was chairman I think I was chairman that year. No, I was not chairman that year, I was another year. But uh, we knew that the CEO was in trouble. So we interviewed, we made, the three of us made an effort to interview staff and it, it did not go well. It really did not go well. Mm. And so uh, we met Monday, full board, and we asked for his resignation and he was gone by the end of the week. Wow. And they said, Paul, we want you to do this. And I'm saying, <laughs> hey, I live 1,500 miles from here. This is a way beyond, you know. Yeah. And uh, they said, no, we'll work it out. And, you know, the time is money made an impression on me because I said, well, I, I have trouble getting to, we're going to break the staff that Saturday that he was leaving. And this was like Monday. And I said, I have to be in D.C this next couple of days and said, great. Uh, and I said, and I have to be there next month or next week. And they said, okay, you fly <laughs> back Thursday night, you work Saturday, you fly back, you Friday and Saturday, you fly back to DC. And I'm going, this is crazy, this is crazy. <laughs> you know? But it, one is, if you gotta do something, mm. you gotta get the resources to do it right. Mm. 
and uh, or change the parameters. And I think uh, that informed some of my thoughts in, in terms of decision making. Of mm. We really have to, we have to take an analytic, a more analytical approach and, and balance out value and cost. Well, these last two questions, again, follow up on that in the sense that, um, as you know right now, um, a couple of people who knew I was going to be talking with you said, tell them about opening, you know, how do they open the archives more days a week? It's, it's pulled back, staffing is reduced, people really care about this, that at least I know, and it's a big deal to them. So we're in another point of financial downturn at this point. How does the library hunker down? And more broadly speaking, how do you convince lawmakers of the value, not just of higher education, but the critical role libraries play in servicing not only the, the, the academy, but the public in general and an open society? How do you do that? It, it, uh, let me go back to the APR okay. thing first. Uh, part of the problem there is a, was a personnel situation that went uh, untended for longer than it should have. And so there were two people who left. And uh, then when you had the financial crisis, you know, if you've got open positions, All right. You know, they freeze positions. You think, well, wait a second. You know, just freeze a percentage of our positions, but you can't freeze all of these because you know, if you have the wrong people leave, mm -hmm. you've got to fill those positions. And so, they uh, they are searching for another assistant archivist. Uh, they offered, uh, they brought Rose Peranza, who has many years there, back, and they I think they have one more position to try to, to fill. And part of that is it's a, it's a tough time to be trying to attract people to a, the University of Alaska. That's I right. I mean, if you're a young professional or a middle uh, seasoned professional, you might think, gee, I've heard all this bad press about the university. Why would I go there on a gamble? Mm -hmm. So I think we have to overcome that. I think we have to really stress that, that there is a tremendous opportunity at the university. I mean, and I think we're we're dampened by this crisis, but I think we're we're going to come through it. I think part of it, the uh, advantage that we had is that all of us were persistent grant writers. So a good deal of the department in the '80s and '90s was was soft money, but we had a number go through. Like I had uh, ended up with eight grants as an emeritus. I took one with me, but I, I had eight. We did a lot of work in the Russian Far East. Mm. We had uh, 11 trips to Russia, and we did work with their scientific staff and their information people in Magadan, Habarsk, and Yakutsk. Mm. Uh, but I think uh, part of it is, w I think personal contact, I think in Alaska, personal contact, personal contact, personal contact is really, really important. You know, we, Even to lawmakers, yeah, for example? Yeah, especially to lawmakers. Especially. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to try to rationalize it. And to, you know, we, we didn't talk about why history is important. And I think the reason that it's so exciting to, to be working in the archives and work in this area is one, it gives you roots in terms of who you are and who you are in, as an Alaskan. It gives you a perspective of what it is like to be in Alaska, because we all haven't been here all of our lives, and even those of us who are younger and have been uh, need to know what went on before us. I think, for me, one of the most alarming things was in the mid-'80s, I think it was, or late-'70s, when they were studying the population of Alaska, they said the average resident of Alaska has been here for less than five years. And you're thinking, whoa, wait a second. They don't, you know, they don't. Very transient. They're transient. It's like coming, you know, it's like visiting, uh, 
you know, at least when you leave home, you, you have this, well, let me say, when we all leave home, you see what our, our family's style of living, and we think, well, we'll just slip right into that, not knowing that, like with my mom and dad, and I did an interview with my dad, which was incredibly revealing to me, is how poor they were when they started out, and you know what they had to go through: Second World War, separation, da da da, da and you know, and we need to know that about what happened in Alaska in 1990 and 1950 and 1900 and 1800. I mean. When you see native people on the street, you have to appreciate that they came here 10,000 years ago. Their forebears came here, and they're still part of our culture, even though we've almost overwhelmed them. That it's an important part. So I think we have to. And that's why I think Bill's work with native people is critical, uh, and we have to involve all of our population. We have to bring history to people again. It's important. Well, um, I usually, about this time, open it up to questions from the audience. And what I'll do, because we're videotaping, and I'll hear your question, and what I'll do is quickly repeat it for the camera and for the audience. But before I do, I have to ask you one question. I know you have a great many hobbies, but you're a terrific photographer. How did you get into photography? And has that always been a passion of yours? Well, you know, uh, a good friend of ours, uh, priest, a Capuchin monk, says, you know, you live life forward, but understand it backward. Huh. And, you know, I was brought up in Rochester. I, you know, I, I didn't put this together right away. Uh, I had two uncles that worked for Kodak. I had a mother that worked <laughs> in the industry during the World, World War II. And uh, I, uh, you know, in Rochester, cameras were Often and many. I mean, uh, <laughs> you just, it, yeah. would, it wasn't anything. Just about like candy, did you? Uh, well, my mom had a movie camera, my uncle had a movie camera, they had still cameras, and, you know. So it was just part of what you might be, you huh. know. And so I came up here, I had a camera, and then I came up here, and there was a little project that Lou Rowinski in the museum wanted me to work on. So I did that, and I bought a camera, and then Pretty soon I bought another camera, and then I, you know, I just used it for a lot of personal and professional purposes. And we did some ultralight, ultraviolet light photography on manuscripts and mm. that kind of thing. And then uh, when I came back in 2002, I really wanted to look at this digital thing. So I visited with my son in California, and. We went to the local store and they were just cleaned out. There was nothing there. It was Christmas, you know. And he said, well, let's, I, let's go down to Sammy's camera. And he said, I always want to go there. And so we went there like the Friday after Christmas, which was still a crazy time to go, you yeah. know. We got in there early and uh, it was like the ultimate candy store. But we, I mean, we had a hard time finding it. We looked around and we couldn't see the address. and. Finally, we did the loop around and we looked up and we saw this, you know, three-story camera on the side of a building. And the reason, they had nothing on the storefront. You know, on the main street, there was oh, nothing. You know, that you know, was the... That was the clue. So yeah. I, I got into digital, and which was fun because I used to have a dark room, but only a black and white dark room. I didn't mess with color because it was too tr troublesome. And so... I thought, wow, this way you can take the picture and control the results and you don't have to send it out, you know. So I started that and then I thought, well, nobody's taking pictures of hockey. And so I took a couple of pictures of hockey and uh, Guy Godowski, who was a coach, said, gee, nobody's taking pictures now. So I said, well, I'll do that. And then I got another camera and then I started taking basketball pictures and I got another camera and then I, it goes, it's a, Spiral down, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sven, you can, you know, you, it's like an obsession, a healthy obsession. Well, does anybody have a question they'd like to pose? Randy? Go way back to the beginning, and I think you said that uh, education was very important in your large extended family. But did you also say that you were the first person in the family to go on to university? 
My cousin and I were, went together. We both went to St. John Fisher, yes. So then in previous years or even previous generations, was the family, you know, got to, you had to do well in high school, but then that was the end, or was yeah. there, oh, okay. Yeah, um, our, my maternal grandfather came over in 1871, and his wife came over in 1872. And they had like eight or ten kids, and uh, you know they did a lot of work worked on the railroad. That's what they did. And uh, my father worked in the hotel industry, and uh, you know they uh, having it. Like I said, my father didn't complete high school, and but he read widely. I mean, like a really widely, and so he burned that in really, and. And maybe it wasn't an expectation, but it was, there was, they helped as much as they could. Mm. I, I, I stayed at home for my college because that was a lot less expensive than paying for a dorm room. Do you have a question? What about, uh, Oh, is there greater fire and flood protection in the library building than in other buildings? Well, there, <laughs> there is fire protection is, uh, in fact, the rare vault has, or did have, I'm not sure what it has right now, but it did have a fire, a gas fire suppression system. Uh, f uh, the, the flooding is a, challenge and the reason I say that is I got a call last week about advising them about a small flood they had in the library. The position of the library is that it's at the, len long, the end of a long chase that comes from uh, the you know, commons, uh, not commons, but the Wood Center in that area and there's been a, at times there's been a hydrant out there's been, uh, there was a backup of a sewage system. They had unfortunately and uncode like lim joined a sanitary and a drain, storm drain system together and there was this terrible uh, flood. So. Uh, Yikes. So it, nothing goes on the floor. Nothing is on the floor, you know. Nothing is on the floor in the, there. And, and the advantage of having the archives in special collections below ground is you can more carefully monitor humidity and temperature. Mm. You know, you don't have an external wall that is 60 below or 40 below or 30 below. The disadvantage is water flows down. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I, I imagine. Uh, just two follow-ups here. What about bombings? Are libraries being protected in any way? Are they considered a higher threat? No, I wouldn't consider it a higher threat. Uh, okay. No, not, it's not been a threat nationally as far as I know. I mean, people use, people, most people or many people have a commitment to libraries that really continues to impress me. You know, like you realize that there was a fundraiser for the Esther Library last weekend. And you think that's been maintained independently of any corporate structure. Right. And in many places, the, one of the first things they want to do community-wise is establish a little library, right? So I think uh, there is, I want to say a sacredness about libraries, but an appreciation, a gut appreciation of what they can do. And, you know, I think the character between, say, us and the public library is notable because, you know, you could be run down by teenagers and young people and their parents going in and out the door of that building. I mean, yeah. they have, you know, this is a research library. Theirs is a, a library that involves storytelling to adults. And I, I guess, one time we had, uh, as deans and directors, talked about how to make students more, or be ready for college. 
and remedial courses and what we were going to do as a university. And I had a chance to go out to Kotzebue, and I, I think everybody should, in the university should go out to a remote site. And out there I saw a native woman and her daughter participating in story time. I thought, this is when it starts. If it doesn't start here, we, it's like, you know, you can either teach your kid to drive well or you can just let them drive and throw some money into uh, an endowment to fix the car. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you, you know, you put a down payment at college collision and you say, hey, just take the car. So I think we need to provide that basic reading skills that whether you're reading a video or you're reading anything, you, you need a reading skill. Well, that leads to the last question she wants to know. Now that you're retired, are you spending your time reading or with photography? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, it's not an either or. Right, right. Some people think that you, you could go into librarianship because you love to read. Man, you're, you're really busy, you know, it's you know, providing service and providing resources. And I enjoy working with people, you know, and uh, when I used to go to lunch with Sharon West, she would say, geez, you're like a politician. You stop and chat with everybody along the way or they talk with you. And yeah, but it's work. Yeah. If I could tell one funny story. When, Please. Uh, we were, when we were moving the library from Bunnell over to the new library, and that's built right where the power plant was. So when I came, the power plant was still there. We had to knock the power plant down to build the library. I approached Ben Atkinson, who was head of services, uh, facility services, and he talked about the costs of moving. And I said, well, he said he didn't have any money. And I said, well, and I'm junior professor at this time, you know. I said, the library didn't have any money either. So we decided to establish a fund that we would just bill it to until we figured out how we're going to do it. But he, he, in his imagination, had the carpenter shop create these huge carts. They probably were four feet wide and probably five, five and a half feet long with multiple shelves in there. We put every freaking book on those carts. I don't know if we had eight or 10 or 12 of them. And the first one was pushed over by Dr. Wood. You know, this, this was when if you were walking with Dr. Wood and there was paper on the ground, he would start picking up paper. And so if you were a dean and director, you were <laughs> picking, up, picking up paper as you, you Leading went. by example. Leading by example. And we moved. The, the tricky part was that the shelves were too, too, too uh, shelf deep. Uh -huh. So when you were unloading it, you had to unload it backward. If you stopped here and you looked at the cart and you had to estimate how much the cart had on it and then you start here because uh, you, you, yeah. you had to move the books that were loaded last out. Right. So you had to do it backwards. Yeah. So there was a, sometimes a little screw up on that. It took a while to read the shelves and you know people used to go through the libraries and read what they call read shelves. You'd check the numbers. Talk about boring tasks. <laughs> um, okay, I have two more questions. Go ahead. Well, a um, few years ago, I went back to Yale for a uh, month to do some work. And the director of the National Library of Peru, who I knew very well, asked me something of a secret mission. He wanted me to find books that have been stored. The, the library was completely flooded the National Library of Peru, like many countries, inside job. And he was trying to restore what's left, but the, the horse was already in the barn. He said, uh, many thousands of books uh, were, were stolen from the library and sold to Yale. And I told him, and to Harvard too, which he didn't know. So I get back to Yale, and uh, the books are uh, they're already dispersed. And I told him, well, that's not, actually, that's better. And he said, well, how's that? And I said, in your library, if I find a book that's still there, that I like, the only way to copy it is my own camera, and somebody stands next to me with a clicker, and it's $2 per photo. In other words, your library is a museum, but it's not a library. And he did a great job of trying to save what was left. I said, Raymond Kurzweil invented OCR in 1978, which is optical character recognition for scanning and digitizing books. Um, I can search thousands of books offline on my computer in a moment. 
go try to find your book. And so what I said, well, just put the shame on Yale and Harvard and all that. I said, you got these books, keep them. But we want a nice, clear scan, and let's make them available to every Peruvian and every person in the world. OK, the archives is kind of being shut down. It seems to me the solution would be, the oldest book in the library, as you well know, is a chunk of cuneiform uh, on a clay tablet. Um, ink on tree bark is not that much different. Yeah, I like reading. I like, I've got more books and virtually anybody I know. But at the same time, that's not word accessible. And so it seems like the solution to the archives, hoping I have to come out of retirement for this, is the money needs to be made to scan in and make the archives accessible. Because paper is nostalgic as it be, but it doesn't function. Um, I'm curious if you have any, please tell me this is being done, I don't know about it. Uh, well, there's, there's some projects that are attempting to do this, but you really have to target what you want to copy. And, and it's not as easy as you might think. Like if you're going through a box, you have to uh, make sure you pull all the pins and any staples and stuff. So there's a cost for pre-filming it. So you, and there's a cost of filming it and the cost of distribution, those kinds of things. And uh, Marvin has had a lot of experience. You could talk with him. Uh, it, it's, it's a solution for highly valued or highly used materials, but not for lesser used materials. Or, you know, sometimes you don't know until people show up what they're going to use. So it's, it's part of the solution. We used, we had a Kurzweil in the library in I think the 70s or 80s, and it was a, a system where if you were out in Bethel, we could copy it, send it to Anchorage, they would upload it to the satellite, but they only had broadcast capabilities. So every village in Western Alaska would, could get the signal. Not that they cared for it, you know. <laughs> I mean, if it, it's a technical thing, but that was the broadcast thing. There was no, it's not like a missile. You know, it's not yeah. like, oh, he wants to use this and there. So we've tried that. Uh, you know, there, there are different ways of communicating it. But it's, uh, it's part of the solution, but the volume of materials, like I think there's over like a million photographs. Wow. You know, so it's, it's a huge challenge. I've forgotten how many tens of thousands of feet there are. Mm. One last question. Just for history that people aren't aware of, the Iverson building when I came on campus was a library. Yes. In 1958. Does anybody know where the library was prior to those years? It was uh, in uh, Signer's Hall. Uh, a number of people, I mean, one of the things I really enjoyed in our country, we really talk about, is all the fun people you meet. You know, uh, the Tremorellos, there were some, uh, like Lowell Thomas was another, but we met so many fun people and interesting people. And, and that, but some of them uh, would recount Friday nights was a really difficult time to study in the library when it was in the upper floor of Sanders Hall because they were playing basketball <laughs> on the lower floor. <laughs> so it was, uh, I think that was the first location of the library. And uh, uh, they talk about that as, you know, and then it moved, I think, then to Banal and then in 66 to where its current location is. I don't know. Your avocation and vocation would mesh very right. well in an environment. Right. Right. You just lean over, take the images, yeah. right. and then check out books. Well, Paul McCarthy, what a joy to talk with you. Well, thank thank you. you so much. Okay, absolutely.